1 Corinthians chapter 12 is our foundational text as we move through the anatomy of the body of Christ. Last week we talked about the most important part of any body, which is the head. And who's the head of the body of Jesus Christ? Jesus is the head. Amen. He's the head and He's the one that uh, disseminates information, gives us, sends the signals to the body on how to function. So we're going to continue on today and we'll start out by reading 1 Corinthians 12 verses 13 and 14. It will be on the screens for your viewing pleasure if you do not have your Bible or device. We have to add that in there, your device with you. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And Paul says much more about the body. You could read on in this chapter. You could read on later. So many things he says about the body. And we're just trying to understand the body of Christ a little bit better. Because it is my firm belief. The more revelation we have about the function of the body of Christ, the less problems we'll have within the body of Christ. If we learn to really appreciate one another as significant parts of the body, then we will treat each other much more uh, respectful and uh, with much more passion and much more love. When we truly see and understand that the way we treat others is actually the way we're treating Jesus because it's His body, it really makes a difference. But unless we thoughtfully embrace this revelation and we take this, these scriptures and put them into our hearts and, and let them soak down into our beings, if we don't do that, then we will begin to think the opposite of what 14 says, which is, the body is not one member. If we're not careful, we'll start thinking, I am the body of Christ. No, no, no. I am part of the body of Christ. You are part of the body of Christ. All together, we complete the body of Christ. It is the way that He has chosen to reveal Himself to the world through His body. So you see, just having this idea that all I need is Jesus and I don't need the body of Christ, I don't need the church, is really a, um, it's, it's, it's not true. It can't, it's impossible to be true. You can't have fellowship with just the head. You have to have fellowship with, just, with the whole body. Amen? There, and that's the way Jesus designed it. And he gives us enough understanding through scriptures, especially when dealing with the things about the body. Now today we're going to talk about the blood of the body. The blood. We talked about the head. We're going to talk about the blood. How the blood permeates the entire body. And uh, I don't think I have to point out all the parallels as you're sitting here. I think that you are quite uh, capable of seeing the spiritual truths that lie behind the physical facts about the blood. I had an opportunity uh, yesterday to experience my blood doing something, uh, helping me out when I came under attack. I pastor came under attack yesterday. It was vicious. It was a yellow jacket. I'll just tell you guys, who's ever been bit by confirmed kill? I mean, prefer, confirmed hit of a hell of yellow jacket. Not I think one bit me. Confirmed. You saw the little yellow and the black. Let me see you. Amen. The few, the proud. Who's been hit by wasps before? Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes compared to yellow jackets. Pray to God that you only get bit by a wasp. Pray to God that four wasps bite you instead of one yellow jacket. I got bit by a yellow jacket yesterday in my arm, and 12 hours later, I was still hurting. Listen, I've been hit in the neck and the face multiple hits, because that's the kind of guy I am, from wasp. <laughs> I was digging around up under our house one day trying to do something to the telephone lines, and I grabbed something that felt like paper. Little did I know, it was a condo full of these wasps, and they went for the juggler. Ah, like five bites at one time they don't hold a candle to what that yellow jacket did to me not a candle because you know what after about three hours they quit hurting after 12 hours I was still hurting and 24 hours later it became itching yellow jacket kill them all <laughs> if you see one kill it okay but what I saw was I saw something happen. I saw what happens when an intruder hits your body. 
your blood automatically pushes fluid to that area. And that's why you get, how many of you get the little, the rise up and the white around it? That's not the poison. That's not the poison from the critter, although you might think it is. And so people think, I'm going to cut this. You're destroying what God happened to bring along in your life to bring healing to you. Same with blisters and burns. You don't cut open blisters and burns. That's, the blood has gathered all that moisture in there to protect that burn and to heal it. How many of you as kids, your parents said, cut that blister? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's like saying, take off your seatbelt, we're about to be in a wreck. <laughs> yep, throw out the fire extinguisher, the house is about to catch on fire. Right? What happens is the blood automatically, instantly, the brain senses that there's been an intruder into the body, and automatically the brain says, blood, start carrying fluid to the spot for a couple of reasons. First of all, to bring healing, but secondly, it dilutes the poison. It and our bodies, aren't they wonderful? And I was thanking God. I was watching that poison being diluted. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. My blood is at work. My body is doing what it's supposed to do. It is getting rid of the <clears throat> devil venom of this yellow jacket. So it gave me something to talk about today. I was talking about the blood. In Leviticus chapter 17, we're going to touch on the blood of the sacrifice and why God chose to cleanse His people by, by the blood, by understanding the blood. How many of you remember, how many of you remember Noah's Ark? Wow, you're old. How many of you hear about, remember hearing about Noah's Ark? There we go. Nobody laughed. It wasn't even funny, Rick. That's all right. I'll get them going. After Noah's Ark rested and they found dry land, then the greatest news that I have ever heard came from the Lord. And that was, you can now eat meat. Praise God for bacon and pork chops. I'm getting hungry. And filet mignon. Porterhouse steak. Praise God. Just imagine, all our forefathers before Noah's day did not know what beef tasted like. Wasn't allowed to eat it. But, we, but thank God, he, he said, you know what? I'm going to let y'all be meat eaters. So that is when we became meatitarians. It's biblical, y'all. Biblical. So you can be a vegetarian if you want to be, but don't be preaching that mess to me because I got scripture and verse. Now, when it comes to eating them rare, I'll, I'll go with you on that because God said you're to drain the blood from the animal. Not because it was bad for you, but because the blood meant something. And He wanted to, God wanted to emphasize the importance of the blood because He knew what was going to happen down the road when Jesus came. He wanted the sacredness of the blood of the Lamb of God to be appreciated. So Israel, prior to Jesus, was a bloody, bloody place. If you just read through the Old Testament and Read about the sacrifices. Tens of thousands of oxen being slaughtered in one day. Can you imagine the bloodshed? The place smelled and reeked of blood. Leviticus 17.11, the Lord says this, The life of the body is in the blood. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible. Those two words we're going to narrow in on. Purification possible. He was pointing out all the way back in Leviticus through the sacrifice, the only way your sins will be wiped away is by the shedding of blood. There is no other way. There is no fig leaf that's going to keep cleanse you. The fig leaf that Adam and Eve made to wrap themselves with, they just covered them, but they did not cleanse them. And to this day, I don't care how holy you dress, without the blood, you are unholy. And I don't care how unholy you dress, with the blood, you are never unholy. Come on. I'm not saying you shouldn't dress in a decent manner. Paul talked about that. But your dress, what you wear, does not determine the holiness of your heart. However, as you esteem towards the holiness of God, it does begin to change the way that you view yourself and the way you're dressed. But we cannot get the cart 
before the horse because if we do, we're not going to get anywhere because the horse has to pull the cart. Okay. So he's making it clear here that the body contains the blood and the blood is the life. And it's only that lifeblood that can bring the forgiveness of sin. And there are many, many different sacrifices that are mentioned in the Bible of different kind of animals on different ways of doing different days of doing it. But, they, but the blood is always the lead when it comes to the forgiveness of sin. Okay, now let's talk about our natural bodies. Without the constant flow of blood through our bodies, our bodies will die. How many of you know that? It literally has to keep flowing. Thus, when you have a heart attack and your heart stops, you die. It isn't because you lack blood. It's because there's no movement of the blood. You, got pl- you imagine, you say, oh, they're dying. Well, they got plenty of blood. Let's cut them, make sure. Yeah, they got plenty of blood. Why are they dying? Because there must be the circulation of the blood. There has to be movement of the blood all the time. And any part of the body that is cut away from the blood flow will only last a a predetermined amount of time, just a short time until you have to get the blood flowing through to that limb, whatever it may be, that has been parted from the body, or what will happen to that? What will happen to that finger that got lost in the chop saw if they don't get, if they don't get it uh, uh, to the hospital and get it put back on and get some blood vessels hooked back up? It will die, become useless and worthless. In the same way, the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ is what flows and permeates the body of Christ. It does, and without the blood of Christ, there is no life. But if there is life, it's because the blood of Jesus has been, has been connected to that person. There has been an engrafting. There has, you have been, well, let me put it like this. Whatever you are in the body of Christ, you were put there by God. You were grafted in like a, like a body part is grafted in. You, ever, you heard of people giving, a, you know, giving an eye to someone else. Well, God has, has grafted all of us in to the body that is a Jewish body, but he's, grifted, he's grafted us into it, and he has connected us to the blood of Jesus, the life source. The well, if you will, of God's eternal life is the blood of Jesus, and it flows through to the body of Christ. And without it, we die. It brings nourishment. Our blood, one of the great things about it is it brings nourishment to our bodies. Well, I thought, I thought Eaton did. Well, it starts there. It starts by receiving it into our body. And then our body does some wonderful things with it and begins to break it down. But all the nutrients that are necessary for our nails to grow and for our skin to reproduce cells and for our cuts to heal, all these nutrients, they travel through the blood. They don't, trouble, they don't travel through the digestive tract. The digestive tract gets it ready for the blood to take it. Okay? So uh, here's, here's the good news. You can be kept alive by hooking a, a thing up to your blood and feeding your blood. I've, you know, that's what happened to Justin, for those of you that remember when he couldn't eat for about seven days. They, they put a direct line into him and they fed him through his blood. And he, that's the only way he was able to do without food because they were bypassing the intestines to let them rest. And thank God he was able to eat. That was really tough. I'd, I'd made up my mind after that fifth or sixth day, I'm not eating until he eats. And after I said it, I went, what did I just say? And then I really went to praying for a healing for him. I got real compassionate <laughs> after I made that commitment. Hallelujah. That next day, praise God, I don't think I had to skip a meal. My faith got working. The body needs the nutrients. Without it, there is not the growth that needs to happen. There's not a defense system that needs to happen. And in, a, in a parts of the body of Christ, if we don't have knowledge of the flow of the blood over us it'll hinder our growth See, you don't have to think about your blood pumping in your body right i mean nobody sits there and goes okay heart keep beating whoop whoop keep keep in sync here all right uh, blood you flow real smooth we don't have to think about it it comes very naturally to us it's the way god made us when it comes to the blood of jesus it's more than what it does on its own it's how we think about it because if we don't understand what the blood of jesus has truly done for us yes we're saved but we won't live like we're saved. We won't experience the beauty and the, and the bountiful life that comes by being aware of what the blood of Jesus is doing for us on a daily basis. That it's the blood of Jesus is our life support. It's not our good deeds. It's not our Bible reading. All those things are great, but that's not what's keeping us in Christ. 
It's the blood of Jesus that's keeping us, and it's flowing all the time, whether we realize it or not. However, the more we re- the more uh, realization that comes into our hearts about the blood, then the more we understand who we truly are and what is happening in our lives, and then it'll begin to manifest on the outside more and more every day, which is why it's important to understand what the blood does. So your body, your, your hands, everybody look at your hands. That's a big old clump of cells, you know, different cells. And, and how do those cells eat? How do they get oxygen? They get it through the blood. The blood feeds the body. And the blood of Jesus feeds the body of Christ in the same way. The blood also brings healing to the body. Through the particular uh, white, the white blood cells and the red blood cells, and I'm not going to pretend to be a doctor, but I will say this, when you, when you receive a cut or an injury, your blood begins to say, send whatever's needed to that cut to bring healing to it. Automatically. And, and here's what's interesting. The rest of your body doesn't file a complaint. What are, what are they getting all the attention for? How come I didn't get any, what is it, red blood cells that go to bring healing or white, Susie? I'm sorry? White, or, yeah, you can tell me that, Mr. Nurse up here. The white blood cells, they, they, they gather and they, they bring healing to that part of the body. And if you have a blood, low uh, white blood count, white cell blood count, then what happens? It doesn't heal like it's supposed to. Well, here's the good news. God's not low on anything. And the blood of Jesus is perfect. And whenever the body of Christ has any kind of problem, the whole body works together to minister through the blood to that person. That's the way it's supposed to happen. Not supposed to cut them off. We're supposed to bring nourishment to them. We're supposed to bring healing to them. In the event of a burn, remember, it brings fluid. It brings water. out of The blood has water in it. And it begins to gather that water up. I know all these nurses, it makes me very nervous talking in front of medical people. (laughs) Because I have read a lot about this, but I'm, that's not who I am. So don't correct me till later. (laughs) Don't correct me in front of everybody. Just pretend like it's right. Because spiritually, it sounds right. As long as I don't get the Bible wrong, we'll be okay. The blood of Jesus feeds the entire body. The entire body is designed to gather around anyone that is hurting. What is our temptation to do when we see another believer hurting? Our temptation is to stay away from them. Why? Because, man, they're going to bring me down. What is that called? Selfishness. We begin to understand the reason God has us in the body is to minister to one another and to lift one another up and to help each other and call for whatever needs to happen to bring healing to that person. Then the body of Christ functions a lot better, which is the whole reason why people wear these masks because they want people to like them. How about, how about we get to a place that we don't have to wear masks and if we're really hurting and someone says, how are you doing? We just really look at them and say, I'm hurting. How about that? How about just something new? How about something just fresh? Now, now listen, and I know that there's always going to be those that say, thank God he's preaching on this. No, I'm not talking about you that hurt all the time and there's never a good day in your life. You, got, you need deliverance. You, don't need, you wear people out. I know you're not here. You're watching on the video. <laughs> listen to me. You wear people down. When you're so needy all the time. That's not who I'm talking to here. I'm talking to people that are afraid to let what's known in their life be known to others because they're afraid of what they're going to think or they're going to withdraw from them. What if we did not withdraw from each other? What if we gathered around one another? Anytime someone tells me I'm having a hard time believing in God, they always look for me to cast them over into the bottomless pit for saying it. And I look at them and I said, well, you know what? God's, God's, he's okay with that. I, I promise you, you've not just jolted him. Your belief is being challenged. That's okay. Christianity, listen to me, is the only movement or religion, if you will, that it's okay to debate it. Have you ever thought about that? Try to debate in Muslim faith. You get killed. Try to go have an open discussion about any other faith and question their doctrines 
But what do we do? We invite the questions. We invite people to say, hey, we invite differing views. As long as they're founded in Scripture, we have a lot of there's different views in this church. And if you ever get into a place where everybody believes exactly the same thing about exactly everything, you're in a cult. You're not in a church. We have been designed to be different within the body of Christ and to love one another in our differences. And not be afraid. Not be afraid to be open with people. Another thing that the blood does is it actually cleanses our body. And after I see some of y'all's bags of McDonald's in y'all's cars, I say thank you Jesus for the blood that cleanses my body of the toxins and the GMOs. Some of y'all are like, what? <laughs> All this food we eat, our bodies does a wonderful thing of, of getting toxins out. And then, uh, I won't tell you where it ends up, but it gets picked up by your blood. The blood is like the little trash cans in all the house. Do I need to tell you where the dumpster's at? No, I don't. They all get dumped into one big dumpster. And that's where the waste comes out. So the blood actually cleanses the body. Con listen to me. I'll see if you can pick up on this. The blood is in constant cleansing mode doesn't stop never stops no matter what you do no matter what you take no matter even if you do it on purpose your blood begins to work against what's wrong in you to cleanse that nonsense out of you come on and you don't have to say well body i'm going to start eating right so now blood you can do it i'm going to get straightened up so the blood can work the blood works can you overload it? Yes. You can kill yourself. Your blood will have so much it can't handle it. You can get so intoxicated with some kind of chemical or something that it can kill you. But here's the thing. The blood of Jesus never loses its power. And it can never be stopped. And it flows through the body of Christ with Jesus Christ as the heartbeat. And it is never going to stop. And I don't care how much garbage you bring into your life, the blood is flowing over it all the time. All the time. Cleansing you. It is a waterfall of forgiveness that falls over the believer, making them holy and, and clean before God 24-7, even in the midst of your disobedience. When he looks at you, he sees holiness. Now, does that make you want to go sin? Are you kidding me? And I've, been, I've had people have some very uh, <clears throat> straightforward words with me about saying that. And I said, I can't help it. It's the truth. I can't help but tell the truth. Just because it makes you uncomfortable does not mean it's not true. No matter what you are doing, the blood is pumping and flowing all the time. And for me, it has caused me to sin less knowing this truth, not more. Can I just can I, can I, I'll be uh, transparent with y'all? In the old days, before I understood grace, back in the old days, when I would mess up, I would sin. I know, everybody gasped at one time, get out of the way. <gasps> A pastor sinned. Wow. Anyway, when I would sin, and I would do something, not like a sin, like, you know, a white sin, like that don't, didn't bother our conscience too much. But I mean, one of them, God said, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, and you did it anyway. That's what I'm talking about. You just did it because you wanted to, right? After I did that, I would sense this separation between me and the Lord. Who's ever sensed that before? And I would be like, oh, Lord. Then I'd be like, a, see, like, this is the Lord. Not that I'm limiting him to a microphone, but... That's the Lord. And I would feel like I'm here. And then I would feel like all this stuff is between me and Him. And I'd be like, and I would lift it up so I couldn't see Him. <laughs> and then I said, now, now that I've sinned, I know when I repent, He'll forgive me. But let's get all this out of my system first. All them sins I've been waiting to do. I was going to do them right now. I already lost fellowship with the Lord. There's I'm already in trouble, so I'm just going to let my flesh have its way. And God helped you if you got around me at that time. I'll tell you what I thought about you. And I was quick-tempered. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. Because I felt this separation between me and the Lord. And so, therefore, I would last in my sin. And then after I'd 
had a belly full of sin, what you do as a believer, you can only do so much as a believer, and then you get sick of it. How many of you know that? I mean, you can try. Who's tried sin until you were full of it? I've tried. I've tried. I'm just going to sin, 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 sin. And before long, you're just like, oh. It's like eating chocolate cake all the time. It tastes good in the beginning, but after the eighth or tenth slice, you start getting a stomach ache. And that's how sin does. There's pleasure for a season, but the end result is constipation. Or death, whichever you want to call it. So I would be, I would see Jesus like that, and I'd, I'd, I'd say, well, I'm going to go get my stuff done. Then when I got done with it, I'd do this. I'd, I'd go, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Lord, really, really sorry. Forgive me. And I'd cry, you know, oh, God, forgive me. Oh, God, please forgive me. And after I'd cried enough, <clears throat> beat myself up enough, then I would feel this again. Now there you are, Lord. Feels good again. But then when I understood grace, I realized that no matter what I did, he was here. He never left. His presence and his love for me was unending and his grace was undeniable and his blood constantly flowed over me. So now when I would sin, I'd be like, man, forgiven already. Can't play around in this nonsense. So therefore, you spend less time in sin when you truly understand what the blood's doing. First John, it says that the blood of Jesus cleanses us. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. It's a verb there. And I love the commentary that I found in one of my books. It says this, this verb denotes a constant, continual cleansing of the blood of Jesus, thereby always making the person holy and acceptable before God at all times. That's good news. And it'll get you out of more trouble than it'll get you in. Pastor, you just gave me a license to sin. You don't need a license. People sin without a license. They don't need my permission to sin. What I'm giving you is a permission to be okay with the fact that no matter what you do in Christ Jesus, you're forgiven. I'm giving you permission to be open and honest with yourself and say, I am the righteousness of God no matter how I feel. Or no matter what I've done or what I'm doing or what I'm doing tomorrow. Well, I don't know if I can buy into that. Well, people that have a hard time with this, I always, I always try this analogy on them, try to help them out. How much good can you do to earn forgiveness? I mean, how much? How many times do you need to take a meal to a homeless person? How many times do you need to sit in church? And How many scriptures must you learn in order to get to that place now where you've done enough good to escape hell and attain heaven? Everybody knows the answer to that. Zero. And, and even before I understood grace, I would say zero. Well, if that's true, then it's also true that to say this, how much bad can you do to, to uh, reject Christ and the salvation? How much, how much bad is it? Is it one time saying a bad word? Or is it two times? How much bad? See, if you can't do enough good to get unsaved, you can't do enough bad to get unsaved. That's just the truth. I am not saying you cannot reject Jesus Christ, but there is a big difference in rejecting your salvation and losing it. Big difference. There's a, how do I know? There's a big difference in taking your shoe out to the dumpster and throwing it in it and not being able to find it in your house because you was careless with it. One's done on purpose. Now listen, if you've looked at Jesus and said, I am done with you, I want nothing to do with you, I want nothing to do with your blood, I want nothing to do with your forgiveness, then hey, then I'm like, okay, I'm no longer going to minister peace to you anymore. But if you're saying to me, Pastor, I have this problem, I keep sinning, and I keep getting beat up, and I keep sinning, I'll say, you are holy and acceptable before God without a single fault. And that's the truth. It cleanses our body. Here's another, one that, here's another thing that the blood does for us. It regulates our temperature. Oh, I like to put it like this. It regulates our temperament. How many of you knew the blood regulates your temperature? So when, you're, when you get into a place where it's really cold, your blood begins to go to the organs and the important parts of your body and it brings all the heat to the center of your body, to your core. Why? To survive. To hold the heat inside. That. That's why when a kid gets dumped in ice water a lot of times, they'll and they're down in a car or whatever. Many of them have been down there for a long time unconscious. What happened? Their body began to slow down. Their blood senses, their skin senses a temperature change. 
their brain says, slow everything down, bring it to the core, protect what's important. And that's exactly what your blood does. It moves everything to the center and everything gets real slow. And that's how the polar, not the polar bear, but that's how the, the black bears and the grizzly bears hibernate in the wintertime. When it gets cold, everything slows down. That's why in the uh, wintertime you don't see many gators in Florida. Whoever's wondered that. They don't travel up north. The alligators, they live here all the time. But when the water's cold, their body slows down. Their heart slows down. Their blood begins to bring everything into the center of their core. And they can stay underwater for hours without coming up. But you let that water get up around 80, 82 degrees, their blood starts coming back out to the surface. And all of a sudden, they're using a lot more oxygen. And that's why they can only stay under for about 30 to 40 minutes in hot weather. In the same way, our body... When we're in the cold, brings the temperature to the center, the blood focuses, but when you get hot, what happens? How many of you get red in the face when you get hot? Isaac looked like he's stepped into a poison ivy uh, forest whenever he gets hot. He just gets all red. That is the blood coming to the surface, getting rid of your heat. It's your cooling system. It's your antifreeze. It's a wonderful thing. When we realize and think about and keep our mind on the blood of Jesus, it will regulate our attitude no matter what extreme we find ourselves in. Come on. When things get bad and we have our eyes on who we are in Christ Jesus, we will learn how to tone it down. I had someone tell me not too long ago about, a, about a, something they would do. They said, I can't help it. Don't buy into that lie. Not as a believer. Now, if an unbeliever tells me that, I'll say, you're right. You're right. I know you can't. They can't help it. They're born in sin. They're sinners. And they're God, their daddy's the devil. And demons drive. They demand. They push all the time. And that's why sinners can truly say, I didn't want to do it, but something made me. But as a Christian, we've been born again. We have a brand new spirit. We're a brand new creation in Christ Jesus, and no one, including God, forces us to do anything. On the contrary, God teaches us and empowers us to do the right things. And when we have the right th thoughts about the blood of Jesus, it'll begin to regulate us, and we will learn how to respond to people in love. How many of you would like to respond in love a little more often? Be, be thinking about the blood of Jesus that flows over your life. Be thinking about the blood of Jesus that may be flowing over that other person's life. And the blood will regulate our attitudes. It will regulate our temperament. Now I want to close with this. In the beginning, when Adam and Eve fell, they had two boys. Cain and Abel. Abel was the good boy. Cain was the bad boy. Abel was submitted to the Lord. Cain was all about putting a show on. When God dealt with Cain, he got angry. And God warned him. He said, sin is crouching at your door. Cain didn't help Cain. Cain just got madder. He was upset that Abel, had, his offering had been accepted of the Lord because it was given in the right manner. And Cain's wasn't because it wasn't given in the right manner. And he killed him. And in Genesis chapter 4, God says to Cain, verse 9, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. And hear that famous quote, am I my brother's keeper? Answer to that is yes, by the way, in case you didn't know. God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. See, we, th we thought we found something. We found DNA. God knew that blood was speaking from the first man that was ever made. Blood speaks. Blood tells on you. The blood has a voice. And Cain's, or Abel's blood, was calling out for something. Wasn't it? Was it saying... It's okay. Forgive and forget. No, that's not what it was saying. It was saying vengeance. 
justice. How do we know that? Because God brought judgment on Cain and judged him. And then we move over into Hebrews, one of my favorite chapters. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. There is a, not as much today, but over the last decade, there's been a real movement to remove talk of the blood out of churches. Because it, people that didn't understand it, it, it could scare them, could offend them. And I, and I admire their motive for that, because I'm all about reaching people. I'm all about it. I just disagree. You cannot take the blood out of the equation and have redemption. There has to be an understanding that we deserve judgment. We are all Cain. All of us were born Cain. Murderers. I'm uncomfortable saying it. Well, that's what you and I were born into sin. And someone died because of us. And His name is Jesus. But unlike Abel, His blood doesn't cry out for justification. It cries out forgiveness and mercy. And that's why when He was hanging on the cross, He said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Oh, come on, I want you to hear me today. How many of y'all know they knew they was killing an innocent man? They knew it. He wasn't saying they don't know they're killing the Son of Man. What he was saying is they don't know that my blood is for them in the midst of their filth and in the midst of their killing me for no good reason. They have no idea that the blood running down this cross is forgiving them for what they're doing right now to me. That's what it meant when he says they don't know what they're doing. They had no idea. The blood that they brought out of that man would forever seal them in the kingdom of God if they would put their trust in Him. Little did they know that without that blood, there would be no forgiveness. And today, you have that blood. If you're born again, flowing over your life, and it's singing a song, you're forgiven. You are whole. You are clean. You don't deserve it, but I gave it to you anyway. All the blood speaks today, but it's singing a different tune. It's calling for mercy. If you're here today and you've never accepted this offering that God's given, listen, this is a one-sided deal. One-sided. God gave everything to someone who had nothing so that we could have everything. I really don't understand how you can analyze biblical truth and not come to the conclusion that I'm going to fall at the feet of this God. I'm going to fall at the feet of this Savior. I'm going to accept this Savior because I have nothing to offer. He has everything to offer. Wow, what a deal. I don't understand how anybody can reject that. Well, they can't except that they're blinded first by the enemy because everyone in here was blinded at some point. There came a time when God lifted the veil. And we recognized our sinfulness and we recognized His holiness. And we knew we weren't going to make it unless something changed.